Welcome to FDBP, Mr. Vikram. Uh, thank you for accepting our invite and uh, over to you. All right. Thank you, uh, Manju. And thank you to everyone here for making me part of this uh, gathering. Uh, uh, I, I have followed your content on, on you know, LinkedIn and other platforms, and I'm really you know, excited to be part of this conversation. So, all right, on with the presentation. My presentation is in relation to consent under the DPDPA. As uh, Manju mentioned, I am with um, Kenview. Uh, although the views expressed are personal, so Ken Kenview is essentially J and J Johnson and Johnson's consumer division. Um, so, from a consumer organization perspective, I think I'd like to present some of my views in what is consent. Um, the agenda is obviously introduction in terms of forms of you know what is consent, forms of consent that I find under DPDPA. Issues with uh, again personal view in you know with the consent provisions and maybe a proposed solution on what might make you know uh, con you know the whole process easier and then of course any questions from the audience here. All right, so let's start. Introduction. So uh, I think the first uh, uh, you know introduction to consent that we have is is under the Indian Contract Act, which is you know when two or more persons agree upon the same thing, and in the same sense. Right now, there's also free consent and the section 14. But before we move to section uh, 14, uh, you know, today, interestingly, is is um, Valentine's Day. And, you know, I think uh, in, in a lot of Bollywood songs, uh, where you know, in some what uh, consent plays a very important part because the hero is always, you know, wooing for the heroine's consent. Um, so, referring to one of our most iconic stars here, Shah Rukh Khan, is considered the king of romance and very important, maybe on Valentine's. Uh, so, the, the reason I chose this picture is because, you know, it's, it's from his movie, Dar, which has this song called, Tu uh, Haakar Ya Naakar, Tu Hai Meri Kiran. So, I mean, ironically, he's, you know, not giving the, the female lead an option of consent at all. He's saying, whether you agree or whether you don't, you know, you, you are, you are, my love interest and so on. So this is why I wanted to highlight this. So this is obviously not a case where free consent is involved, right? Because when consent, what the act says is that when consent is not obtained through coercion, fraud, misrepresentation or mistake, then it forms free consent. So as we see in this example here, this is definitely not free consent under practice. Right, so we move on from consent under the Contract Act to consent under the DPDPA. Um, it, again, there's a definition here, the consent given by the principal has to be, so it is on similar terms of what uh, the Contract Act provides. It has to be free, specific, informed, unconditional, and unambiguous with a clear affirmative action, right? So this is again going to be one of the challenges we will address that clear affirmative action that shall signify an agreement uh, to the use of the data subjects data for a specified purpose as is necessary. So uh, this is consent as defined under DPDPA. Now, what can be the uh, you know challenges here? So I'm sorry, the principle. So I, I am trying to link, see, as, as we are all aware, uh, there are certain principles that, you know, we are required to practice in terms of data processing, data collection. So the way I would interpret this, uh, so before we go to consent, I, I know just like in, in this movie, Mohabbate, where Amitabh talks about the principles of his educational institute uh, that he refers to. Similarly, I think there are sort of hallmarks or pillars that an organization needs to have in place when it is, uh, you know, intending to uh, ensure or, or to put in place a consent framework. Now, these, according to me, are the principles I think an organization needs to have in place. So data minimization to ensure that when consent is taken, it is taken only for that specified purpose. There is some sort of transparency in the fact that when you issue a notice to the data subject, there is going to be, uh, you know, transparency about what the data is going to be utilized, where it's going to be stored, whether they want to, we will be engaging in, you know, direct marketing practices with them, whether we will be sharing it with a third party vendor. These are need to be form uh, of the, the privacy, you know, the consent notice that will be provided. 
and then there is accountability what do i mean by accountability there will need to be you know a privacy notice in terms of what are the privacy practices that the organization follows so whether in the form of a qr code or a hyperlink or a separate web page when there is online activity allow um, in in place so the ac accountability in terms of you know what is happening with the data uh, how we intend to protect it this this kind of notice also needs to be provided so this in sort of very brief are the principles of consent similar to what the the dialogue here says all right um moving ahead now so here's where i think uh, you know there's slight bit of a challenge or an overlap in in sort of uh, the consent provisions under the act so while we saw what is consent there is also a concept what is known as the legitimate use right now legitimate use it says that for where consent has been provided voluntarily but where there has the data subject has not specifically um refuse the use of her personal data it is said to have uh, the the data can be utilized uh you know you can you can construe it as uh, consent so this is uh, you know sort of i in my opinion there is slightly an overlap with the principles of consent that has been provided perhaps under the contract act versus what has been provided here now why do i say that it's because of this right so when we intend to say you know when an organization is required to uh, provide as the earlier clause said specific notices or notices which are account you know transparent in terms of usage of the data subjects information but if we then are to rely on the legitimate use of that data then the organization might be tempted to draft very wide notices to ensure that the data subject has you know uh, provided consent over all possible uh, um, you know purposes that the organization might want to utilize that data for right so uh, secondly i believe that you know the the earlier clause talked about an unconditional and unambiguous uh, consent being provided now in this scenario which we looked at previously where there is where it talks about no specific refusal uh, i believe it has a contradiction in terms of um, you know unconditional and unambiguity being offered so my my view point is that the legitimate you is clause has a slight clash with what is required under the consent clause right excuse me <clears throat> this also leads to a particular scenario where the specified purpose has been stretched because if we talk about in the consent clause uh, that the, the consent being taken for a specified purpose but then we intend to use it for purposes where there is no specific refusal on the part of the data subject then the 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 purpose for which you know the whole purpose concept has been stretched to a particular extent so this this again may run contradictory to the intended consent clause now wh whether we kind of end up in a scenario where overt reliance on consent may lead to consent fatigue on part of the data subject um, so that that's something that we need to think about as we go up further all right so this as i said you know leads to a slight confusion between the parties and hence the illustration all right so i have some additional consent related challenges so as you see i mean there's a, still from the movie amar akbar anthony india is a place of you know many religions many languages so we have uh, i may be wrong on this but i i understand i think there are 122 official languages as per the census so to get clear specified and you know unambiguous uh, consent across all languages is going to present a problem for the uh, you know the 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 fiduciary here it or the data controller to ensure that you know clear language uh, consent has been obtained right uh my second concern is is around you know educational disparity now what i mean in this scenario is that when uh we draft a notice you know a privacy notice as i had mentioned in my previous uh, slides uh, we intend to convey to the data subject uh you know the, all possible uses of his or her data right now given that there may be a difference in terms of understanding what 
certain terms mean, say, in terms of, you know, like it could be something like an analytics or processing or, you know, maybe even maybe a cross-border transfer. The understand, I mean, it's difficult to gauge whether, you know, people across the market are able to gauge what those concepts actually mean. So the, the efficacy of having, you know, the, the, the notice or the being equally understood by people across India, I think, becomes a challenge. So that's that's an other additional consent challenge that I believe exists. All right. So now we move on to the concept of consent manager. I know this is an issue of, of a lot of you know discussion, debate, and so on. So I think consent manager is like Batsan here. He's been incorporated into framework to help with the consent process to defend the rights of the data subject, as you see Mr. Batsan here, kind of in a superhero avatar. All right, so consent manager under the act is a person registered with the board who acts as a single point of contact to enable the data principal to give, manage, review, and withdraw her consent. So. I in my previous slides I talked about you know um, the fact that you know we there would be challenges in terms of implementing consent or ensuring that consent has been uh, clearly understood. I mean, what the privacy notice has been understood by the intended data subject. So I think with that in mind, the the act or the regulations incorporate the provision of the consent manager, but uh, I, to to sort of help the process along. So this, you know, but I think there are still um, certain challenges that that may exist within the consent uh, manager framework. Now what challenges there are is I, you know, firstly, there needs to be, you know, I think obviously this will happen over the course of time, but there needs to be an sort of, you know, an interaction with consent managers, because as, as the above clause says, uh, there, there, you know, um, how, how do I put this? So their consent man, you, you, you need to ensure that your organization is, is capable of dealing on a regular basis with consent managers to ensure that, you know, they accurately represent the data subjects that they are responsible for. This way include making them part of our data subject uh, request, you know, system, response system. Um, so these are, you know, challenges that may come about that that the organization will have to be doing. It could be something very basic like how do we ensure that the consent manager is indeed authorized to act on behalf of a data subject. So, and then how we incorporate such verification procedures within our data subject response system. So in the other geographies that I have worked for, honestly, such kind of, you know, uh, uh, such kind of entity does not exist. So we have to, I mean, all of us here have to modify our existing, you know, systems to, to incorporate this uh, concept into place. Uh, yeah, so I think I, I mentioned this previously also. So incorporating them, interacting with them, ensuring that, you know, the consent manager accurately conveys our intent or vice versa to us as the data fiduciary. These are challenges that may come about. Uh, while interacting with the uh, consent managers, so this is um, from the uh, the the this is basically from the government uh, kind of scheme or description of how the consent manager is required to work. So as you see, there is a data there is a consent flow requiring uh, you know between the user and the consent manager. I'm I'm sure some you know all of us have seen this flow chart previously. So I'll 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 not spend. Uh, much time on it um yeah all right so i am going to move on to solutions here which which i think is uh, appropriate from my side so in the previous slide just as a recap you know i talked about their possibility of being a consent fatigue if there is going to be an overt reliance on consent uh, by the you know e even though there is a consent manager network in place now, uh, my my personal thought is around the use of a provision which is similar to that of legitimate purpose in GDPR. I think it's six one f if I'm not mistaken, and uh, s seven as well under GDPR. Now, when is legitimate purpose used? 
so legitimate purpose is used when it is not you know the processing is not required by law but it is of clear benefit to um the you know the data subject there's limited privacy impact on the individual uh, where the individual can reasonably expect you to use their data in that way and so on so why do i propose the use of a concept similar to legitimate purpose now why we have legitimate use as a term utilized uh, i believe we can extend it or stretch that concept to use legitimate purpose especially for the purposes of something like direct marketing now direct marketing is something that you know cop especially consumer organizations like my, uh, my the one that i work for are very interested in as you will be aware the speed of direct marketing you know is of utmost importance we need to reach out to customers on a regular basis there's always a rush to reach out to the consumer uh, to to let them know of you know you know to to target them with appropriate uh, uh, you know which uh, communication which is of their interest now for all those purposes you know for all these events if we are to obtain their uh consent in every specific instance then then i repeat that you know we will end up in a very consent fatigue scenario right so to avoid this consent fatigue scenario my belief is that the purposes the, the use of a concept like legitimate purpose especially for direct marketing purposes which i believe falls under the categories listed here which i have replicated from uh you know gdpr which is that you know it it's it may be of benefit to the consumer that i think there's a limited privacy impact because it's marketing it may not involve the usage of his or her sensitive data and it may be reasonably expected to be utilized you know say for instance i'll give you my my company's example right so if there is an individual who is interested in maybe like a baby talc then we can reasonably reach out to them with like a baby shampoo related direct marketing campaign or such so uh then the the reason is that so consent fatigue is avoided speed of you know targeted marketing is not disrupted so these advantages i think is is very helpful if we are to utilize this um i also wanted to bring in you know the the kind of consider the use of real time translation tools i think uh, i think like google bashni i am aware that you know i think one of the recent uh, public talks that you had our prime minister used this i think in real time uh, i think tools like this are very very important to consider if we have to utilize especially when we we interact with you know data subjects uh, to have a communication at on a real time basis so i think i'm i'm not fully aware of how this technology would work in a real time but i think this is definitely something worth exploring to overcome challenges especially for you know hotline or translations when subjects call to ask about their you know actual rights or or any consent related issues this is something that can be utilized so these are two of my suggestions and uh, that essentially is my presentation so i'm happy to take any queries or any concerns that you have thank you i'd like to ask one question uh, oh please so in in scenarios where let's say the target audience uh, and i'm taking a generic uh, you know view here that let's say the target audience for a consumer product like yours has not specifically mentioned that you know they should be contacted or should not be contacted under that circumstance how does uh, the organization take a stance of reaching out to them with say a proposal or maybe you know something about uh, you know providing more details about their product so that in terms of soliciting sorry so deepak right that's right i deepak uh, so deepak when we so the i if i may have a question to you so when you said the, the consumer here now i would assume that when uh the transaction with the consumer has taken place the consumer has 
had the opportunity to sign off on the privacy you know the consent and the privacy notice as well because no. if you remember the clause says uh, you know there is a clear affirmative action of consent provided so affirmative action my interpretation would mean you know clicking on the button saying i agree to the policy or checking on that box uh, those kind of things so no, like for example uh, th this is prior to the transaction so uh, that's why I was mentioning that if there is a dialogue or if, if there is even intent expressed by the target audience saying that I am interested, then there is a conversation and leading to a transaction. Mm -hmm. But prior to, uh, you know, I, I'm talking about the soliciting phase where, you know, both the company and the target audience both are not, have not met as yet. And now it's going to be the first initiation and therefore there is no preference indicated by those individual set of individuals saying that they should be contacted or should not be contacted under such circumstances. How does maybe a sales team or those kind of things, you know, try and reach out to these people. So this could vary from each organization's approach, but then I would interpret this as a scenario where there is one is exposed, exposed to maybe like a general sort of ads when when maybe somebody scrolling to Facebook or Instagram and then one kind of comes upon an ad that one likes and then clicks upon it. And thereafter, you know, the process begins. You click upon it and you then want to en engage into a purchase. And then you say what, you know, the information that you shared, maybe you are redirected from the social media site into the, you know, the same same site. I think there are now scenarios where within the, 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 the website itself, you have embedded kind of consent terms. I think we have experimented with that as well. So those are kind of scenarios one would look at. Let me take a more specific example, right? Meaning what I understood is that you're, you are saying that the uh, buyer has to reach out to the organization and then therefore the process would be invoked. But let's take an example of credit card, right? Like mm -hmm. a bank gives out credit cards and it still needs more target audiences to buy the, or, you know, subscribe to their, uh, you know, credit card schemes. Mm -hmm. Now, let's say that I am one such, you know, uh, individual who has a target of getting these things done. Now, how do I reach out to these people if people have not indicated their preference or I don't know their preference of being contacted is okay or not okay? You mean like reach out to audience, like in terms of someone? I want, that, to, you know... I, I want maybe Vikram to take a credit card from me. How do I approach him if I don't know his preference? So that would be kind of, as I said, you know, that that would be through floating of an advertisement or, you know, those kind of scenarios where somebody has to click upon. That is the method that I would, uh, in my opinion, uh, kind of, Pose the line in terms of what the legislation offers, because I also I'm I mean the other obviously you know scenario would be to kind of you know call Vikram and say hey I'm interested in the card, but then we run kind of a foul of the uh, right. you know the provision where you know Vikram is not consented to utilizing right. his or her. So the only other kind of you know maybe if if there has been. Uh, you know, any sort of previous engagement where you have previously interacted with Vikram or Vikram has, you know, shown interest or uh, I, I, you, you, you met him somewhere. I mean, it, it, I, I, you know, that, that kind of scenario. So you, you're leveraging a previous interest shown by Vikram somewhere to come in. Uh, but, but to do that, to call out of the blue, I think would maybe, you know, uh, how, how do I say it? It, it may fall if it of all the problems. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I'm sure a lot of people would have that dilemma because mm -hmm. that your target audience would be more than your previous relationships or, you know, yes, existing customer base. Yes, that's correct. So it, it's going to be difficult to establish. Hence, you know, the challenge of, I mean, or the, the problem with drafting like too wide a notice wherein somebody would say, you know, if you sign up, uh, then we will share our, your data with our marketing, whatever our affiliates and our friends and their whatever, you know, their friends and so on. So, yeah, th that kind of things may happen. Sure, sure. Thank so you. I will, I am going to give you an example which just happened with me. So, I live in Thane in Mumbai, for those of you who may be aware, and there was recently the opening of, I think, what is known to be like Mumbai's largest park there. 
and uh, it is it is although it's it's i mean it's a government owned park but it's managed by these private developers uh who i shall not name uh, but i think we we entered and and we we had to you know submit our details while entering the park and pay a fee and then i think the next day we were we received a call from the developers asking if we were interested in one of their properties so uh somewhere maybe you know i don't know there was no consent taken for this share but yeah there it was kamal had some question understood yeah um just an observation um uh, thanks for the information mr vikram uh yeah, now you you mentioned something about offering uh, credit cards like mr deepak was mentioning here uh but uh, isn't it that in um, as far as um, i'm just talking sorry i'm i always talk about gdp but i also learning a lot about indian uh, methodology but how long does the consent last is it not uh, during the promotional period because when the promotion period ends uh, don't you think that the consent ends there sorry so can i can i go back to your question so you're saying now that depends on what consent has been taken place right so uh if there is okay so let's let's go with your example so when you say consent was taken what was the consent taken for it was consent i would assume it is consent taken to reach out to that individual so so let's say that you know the the credit card person has taken your consent to reach out or to directly market the consent to you in that case yes if you then you know if they do reach out to you and you are not satisfied with the whatever the offer in relation to the consent i mean so in that credit card you know uh, offer or whatever the terms and conditions are then that specified purpose in my understanding would be over because of the the i mean that discussion being you know kind of stopped by you there mm -hmm. yeah because and, yeah sure you carry on sorry no no that's that's basically i so i'm just i i am i know i'm going back and forth but i was just trying to think okay. of that scenario yeah we yeah, because uh, for example if a gym is uh, running um, uh, apart from the credit card uh, say for example a gym is running a promotion that mm. gives uh, members opportunity uh, to opt in or receiving emails with tips and etc um now this the the consent is likely to degrade over the time but um uh do you think that uh, within the indian uh, um dpdp uh, how long is it last uh, is it to do with the contents of the offer or uh, is it to do with the uh, marketing email itself i mean uh, whatever they are offering the services so it is services which are affiliated to the membership of the gym so i believe the consent would have been should or at least should be necessarily be drafted to coincide with the duration of the membership you know so maybe once that is over and okay no, yeah there is a second part in it you know there, there's a, like a this offer say for example this offer is only for the month of february and when the month of february ends on 28th of february of course so from 1st of march um do you think they should be still pursuing me for that or not that's the question all right so let me go back a step so when whenever so i the, you know the, the 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 lawyer who has drafted the notice and i am a lawyer so i am not bad mouthing my own kind here but sure. you know whoever has drafted the notice now we have to go back and see what is the purpose it was drafted for right so whether whether it is to reach out to you whether it is limited for a particular contest so for instance as you as you rightly mentioned if if like you know for instance in very often in the consumer world we have like a particular contest you know say for example there's a whatever like a, a valentine's day contest and then so the if consent has been taken only for that specific purpose you know mm -hmm. send a photo with your significant other on this and win something you know win a gift the consent has been taken only for that purpose then it lasts but then if if it is to reach out allow the gym you know to to write utilize it for a longer period of purpose especially you know only for the purpose of maybe like direct marketing then it may be considered to be on a longer time uh it can be argued that you know it has it has it um, it has met its specified purpose as you have you know rightly said 
so we need to kind of see how how those stretched purposes survive the test of uh, the law I, I get you i get your point like I, I i understand what you're saying whether they need to limit that consent for that specific offer period or whether they need to stretch it kind of you know for further reminding you or those kind of things so that that needs to be seen under dpdp how, how that kind of will survive okay or if thanks. at all they'll survive thanks sir b sorry i'm going to add on here okay so this is from personal uh experience so i have similar questions from my marketing team you know they like um so for instance they'll say you know let us try to take uh consent you know vikram from like you know let, let, let's let's try to it's like when we take an individual's consent let's try to get his consent for like everything right so for instance like if we have a you know obviously like a cosmetic line and then we have a baby care line and then we have whatever so sometimes what happens is there's an intersection in the the target categories like for instance if you have an infant care line and we have a skincare line the the user that's the mother may be in the same age range right so those marketing teams say you know we have a demographic here mother may be in a you know late 20s or early 30s uh, and, and she's kind of falling in both. So she's like the ideal target for marketing across. The challenge, what I see here is that, you know, if you are going to make it too broad, then if the data subject at some point decides to say, you know, stop sending me stuff or, you know, wants to, you know, exercises the right of deletion or the right to forget, then you're going to end up losing, you know, like the ability to target that user for, you know, all of, you know, every, everything that you previously reached out to her for. So I, in my opinion, if you keep it specific I, and maybe kind of stretch it according to the legitimate use concept, then maybe I think you have a better chance of not being, you know, blocked out completely because we may also reach that scenario where, you know, like the user says, I get, I signed up for only one and I'm getting all these different mails. I'm going to block out and, and, and the organization might end up losing, you know, a lot of like the whole, the ability to the, on that customer entirely if that helps yeah sure thank you yeah there dipti you have a question mm. yes uh Vikram, coming back to the discussion uh we were having with regards to so one uh, there are two points that came to my mind one is that uh, do we look at uh, the cold calls ending with what dnd &D could not achieve Will DPDPA be able to achieve, I mean, like random calls, you know, from the real estate agents and uh, specifically with regards to your um, insurance policies, you know, you have a MediClaim renewal coming in and two, three months before random calls from personal experience, I'm saying you start getting these calls you've never signed up for. Um, and two, with regards to that, embedded consent that you said if i'm just browsing there are so many times these pop-ups can come in and even if i don't want to click them they just get clicked and i may just see and cross it and come back i have no interest will that website and tomorrow we can claim that i have given a consent and they can call because it it, it has happened you know uh, you say you go on money control and they pop up ads and you just cross them. But sometimes instead of crossing, you it just pops up, opens into a advert website altogether and you are redirected. And then you just see you're not interested, you close it. And mm -hmm. then after five minutes, you suddenly get a call. Your mobile number has been tracked or you get an email that you were on the website. So how do you see these two things um, with DPDPA consent. Yeah, in fact, uh, I want to extend the, this first part of the question. This is Ramesh here. Uh, nowadays, we also have a keyword hearing from these callers. We have a database, sir. So we, we don't know what is the database and, and where it gets it. Though I give a legitimate consent for a, a renowned company, yes, they might follow some of these procedures. But uh, again, some of them really call these things are randomly generate the numbers and keep calling is we don't I don't think we have a control or a consent there so uh, 
sorry, I, 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 could I respond or? Yeah, yeah please. Please. All right, thank you. Okay, so deeply long question on your part and thank you, Mr. Ramesh, for the ad. Uh, I think the first question was in relation to the, you know, the, the, the spamming. So pardon my, you know, sense of humor, but I go back to that whole, you know, the Shah Rukh Khan and the, the cinematic thing at the end of, you know, those, those Bollywood movies, they always show the, the couple getting happily married. Now, whether they remain happily married is something, you know, left for us to decide at the end. So it's similar to that. I feel, you know, like whether this will eradicate the DND calls is something that we need to kind of look and see that was in humor. So I, I but I think, I, I think the, the, the authority has, you know, a big challenge on its hand to enforce action. I think it depends on how we kind of, you know, build to exercise our right of action against such kind of callers. And then we, I think we, we as a subject need to, uh, you know, exercise our rights, you know, demand to see where fr from such callers, you know, where consent was taken, you know, uh, to, to understand, to, to ask them where the privacy policy is. So I think once we as data subjects start exercising or demanding our rights uh, in, in terms of, you know, then I think action will follow. And then these, these players, I think by default will be, you know, either forced to limit or put in maybe, you know, policy in place. So if, if uh, such as, you know, have, have a privacy policy or give us some avenue to see how our data is being utilized. So I think that, I think it's a, it's a two way street. It, it depends obviously on how the DPA, uh, the authority falls into play, and also how we as data subjects uh, choose to exercise our rights. Uh, so that's my response for the first part of the question. I think the second part of it was relation to the website. Now, generally, the way you know this this works is that when you travel or you trawl the web. Uh, you know, you have websites, including Google. I am aware that they're supposed to stop the cookie, uh, you know, uh, the, the cookie mechanism soon. So, but they, 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 you have these websites that track you. And then obviously sites such as these, you know, Google, you know, Instagram, they, they have the cookie, you know, they, they want, they decide to sell your data to organizations or to, to let them know that you are interested in a particular transaction. Uh, which is why then you get something like a customer customized ad from time to time, uh, in, in in terms of what you may be interested. So if I I I you know I recently I saw like whatever a used car and now I keep on getting used car ads throughout my Instagram feed. That's that's basically how the algorithm is working. So that is something that you have to. I mean, how how sorry like how can you get rid of it? Uh, I think that's that's basically just how the algorithm works. They they keep a track of you. I know now you have sites or you have mechanisms to stop, you know, the cookies. I mean, you, you can reject the marketing cookies. You can restrain the usage of a website only to essential cookies in terms of aggregate. So the website may not track you in person. So those are kind of, uh, you know, actions that you might under, I mean, you, you, you will have to take. Um, I think, some websites in India do that as well right now. So those are actions that you have to ensure that you are kind of kept away from the the ads or the follow ups that uh, you just mentioned off if that answers it. Yeah. Yes, uh, thanks Vikram. I think probably um, once the rules come in and once we see some fines getting imposed, probably then a lot of action I think in my personal opinion, we can see because uh, even if uh, uh, there are a lot of sites who still don't have the uh, essential, uh, the differentiation in the cookies on the websites. So apologies. I know I have stepped in uh, and I again, apologies for that. But look, as I mentioned, I think it's always going to be a two way street, right? So let's say, you know, you, you, get those calls right we still get those calls from the those callers i think at at some level we need to be aware of what our rights are i, I mean obviously forums such as yourselves uh do such a wonderful work in terms of you know awareness of privacy so you know wh when there is awareness when data subjects you know start asking the people that call you know like you have my yes. information where can i see it where can i correct it where can you show me the consent that has been taken at some level or how is it that you ask so that kind of repeat or you know obviously then the 
how do I say this? It, the counter is that, you know, you say that unless I see where these these details are, I refuse to do business with you. So it's, it's not just the question of blocking the doubt, but asking them for a level of transparency. I think when more of that increases and, and the number of people asking that increases, organizations at any level will be required to do it. So it could be whatever, you know, your, your finance, your insurance scholars, your anything. They, they, they will eventually have to put that policy in place. And I think that will be a sort of that, that place where we need to be at. Right. So true. So awareness campaigns play a very important yeah. role uh, uh, with regards to the implementation of uh, DPDPA. Yeah, I think so. I think I think it, it will very help, uh, you know, as I said, you know, places like forums like yourself, maybe government awareness campaigns. I think those would need to be hand in hand with the, the passing of the law. I think that is an additional, you know, thing that that hopefully will be done. Thank you. Thank you, Vikram. Um, questions? Yeah, just uh, want to share an experience I had a few weeks ago um, while traveling in India for f past five weeks. Uh, many religious places um, need your phone number now uh, when making a tiny little contribution. And uh, when I said I don't have a number, um, it, it was almost like I don't want your donation, you know. And uh, I felt, um, I told him, look, the number is um, not uh, um, uh, in, for this country and all that, so it won't help you at all. And yet uh, the guy insisted, you, I need a number. And... Um, Luckily, the person who was driving me around, I asked him, <laughs> do you mind if I give you a number? And uh, I had to give like his number uh, before he could issue me a receipt because it, it was something for another person I was doing um, and making a donation. And um, I found it a bit um, really difficult. I mean, they should have just accepted the money and that's it, and end of story. But um, I, I'm wondering whether... Is this a bigger um, question in thought, you know, apart from, uh, I know we are talking about businesses cons uh, taking consents and all these kind of things. What about religious places? Because I know in uh, UK, I'm only talking at the moment, uh, many religious places have got um, GDPR in place and consent uh, in order as best as they can. So what about um, uh, looking at those aspects also? What are your thoughts? What are my thoughts, sir? I think uh, you know that's that's an interesting question. It's it's a tricky one to answer, admittedly. So, I mean, if there has to be kind of usage of an individual's information, then there needs to be grounds, or you know, there needs to needs to be certain policies. Now, I am not aware of any exemptions that the law may grant to quote unquote religious places. So. We need to see, as you rightly mentioned, how how they may have to change their policy, or whether you know uh, uh, what 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 will be done when the law is up up and running. Sure, thank you. Um, if I may take uh, uh, to Kamal's question, um, I would like to express a view here. Uh, there are two things. Um, setting aside the DPDPA rules when with regards to the consent, what we are looking at is the culture in India, one, is very different than what it is in Europe and uh, UK. The adoption of privacy, uh, the meanings of privacy in India is largely very different. Um, and two, from the religious donations point of view, uh, with my experience uh, in finance industry, um, that kicks in with your KYC and uh, AML policies also. Um, though we though we need to look at on how large the donations are, um, sometimes you are required uh, to give identification from where the money has come from. So yes, um, that needs to be looked at per transaction wise. Maybe the threshold needs to be decided on that front. Um, but I, I I do believe that you know from the financial aspect uh, and the controlling of the uh, AML guidelines. Uh, the identification of donors are used in all kind of these charitable and um, donation places. So hence that mobile number or the identification demand 
but in my personal opinion there has to be some threshold of what kind uh, what level of donation is there so you can't be asking um, somebody who's donating say 500 rupees um, with regards to somebody who's donating 5 lakh rupees exactly so okay. that that's my take on that yeah thank you that i think that's a very valid point so you're saying more more in terms of a corporate i mean an organizational compliance on the part of the religious institution Yes. Uh, so from financial guidelines as well, if you are uh, managing the policies and the framework of a charitable uh, institution who are taking donations like an NGOs, they are pulled up because they get a lot of uh, right. foreign donations. And um, a lot of these setups have been used for anti -money, la uh, money laundering aspects and financial crimes. So hence those um, policies also kick in for them for monitoring. Yeah, that's very helpful. Thank you. I think, yeah, I think that's the answer. Yeah. Anyone else? Navi, sir, would you like to add anything, sir? Navi, sir. Uh, thank you, Vikram, for uh, your excellent uh, presentation. Uh, you were very lucid, and uh, uh, there was no need for me to intervene because you were uh, uh, talking uh, whatever I would have perhaps. Uh, said for the same thing. Okay. Uh, there's only one point which I want to add to what Kamala Acharya was uh, talking about. Uh, just to point out that uh, the consent has to be purpose specific. There is no doubt about it. So that that purpose can be one time use of uh, the data or a period wise use of the data or multiple use of data uh, a number of times, like uh, uh, certain times, five times, you can have any type of consent. Now, the problem where today is that we try to take a consent from a data principle, thinking that there is a relationship between the data principle and the data fiduciary, and it will extend over a period of time of his uh, uh, relationship. Now, where um, the data is collected once, and it is used for different purposes within the organization. That is, you collect 10 data points of a person, like the name, address, email, uh, phone number, uh, PAN number, and something. For certain purposes, you don't require a PAN number. You require only the name or uh, email address. For certain purposes, you require the PAN address. You may even require the KYC requirement uh, kind of a thing. When we look at this entire data set as one single data set and try to collect everything from a person at one point of time, we have this kind of a problem of uh, where, where, how to define the process, I mean, uh, purpose. So what we have done in DGPSI, Kamal, you need to look at uh, our DGPSI. We have said the consent should be process-centric, not the company-centric. So if the process is X, we will mm -hmm. say that I require the data points one, two, three, and I take that consent. If it is a KYC, for example, it's a one-time yeah. use of your camera on the mobile because KYC is only for that one particular onboarding uh, process. After that, I don't require your uh, camera permission. I may not require your SMS uh, permission. So if you think that the compliance is process centric part of the problems which you said about how do i determine the purpose whether i can use it for multiple times and other things will get solved so look at comply an organization should be considered as an aggregation of processes okay so process one process two process three process four what is the purpose of process one what is the data which i require for process one I collect it, and for that particular purpose, I take the consent. Now, if that purpose is over, then you immediately get into the obligation to delete the data for that particular purpose if it is no longer required for something else. So I feel that in, in the Indian context, or at least whatever DGPSI context, if you look at a process-centric compliance system, okay, then the identification of the purpose becomes easy and then uh, I think some of the problems will get uh, uh, sorted out. That is the only point I just wanted to mention. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any other questions? 
Uh, as privacy professionals, we are all excited that DPDPA is here. Uh, but uh, I think uh, as an individual, a citizen, a customer, I am all the more excited about this uh, data protection law being in place, especially when we you know, discuss consent, because we are all uh, tired of all this uh, you know, unsolicited marketing calls. And thank you, uh, Mr. Vikram, for an excellent presentation. Uh, I invite Deepthi for the closing remarks. Um, thank you, Vikram, for joining us and thank you for accepting my invitation at such a short notice. I um, uh, We are happy to have you and we look forward to um, further such uh, interactions with you. Um, we have a Telegram group. If you are on Telegram, please do join us. Um, it's an industry professionals group for where we exchange our updates and knowledge about um, privacy and security and data um, and other aspects with regards to data. and. Uh, um, we look forward to having you again sometime and uh, more interactions uh, going forward. And probably we'll, um, anybody of us can be in touch with you um, from the forum to connect with you on LinkedIn. Um, thank you. Sounds good. I, I just wanted to say I'm I'm really I mean really appreciate being a part of this. I, I as I said I see Navisa's you know inputs on and I follow them on on LinkedIn. It's always good to be you know part of discussions with fellow privacy professionals. I think the resulting discussion is that much better when we thrash out ideas. So thank you once again for making me part of it. Appreciate it. And I personally appreciate the sarcasm that you always try to input. You know it's it's really unique way of expressing. Your thoughts uh, on I privacy. I spent too much time as a child watching television, so I think that is a resultant <laughs> effect. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank I think you. probably uh, while uh, framing our uh, awareness campaigns, uh, we could really make use of your um, childhood experiences in drafting this because these kind of presentations, I believe, personally will have more impact um, spreading awareness with regards to uh, the privacy culture, which is uh, to be created, and with regards to our Indian scenarios. Yeah, I think so. I think so. As I think movies is something that I've seen, you know, cuts across a whole Indian whatever you know segment. So I think as as we talked about previously in the call, awareness is is very critical. I mean, the the government has obviously drafted this fantastic legislation. But I think it's, it's going to be only as good as we kind of exercise our rights and therefore we need to be aware of it. So whatever helps, happy to be part of that if, if I can. Thank you so much, Vikram. Thank you so much for this.